This is Health Call Online, the place for extended versions of interviews heard in our weekly radio broadcast, the Health Call Radio Hour. All of us are concerned about Alzheimer's disease, at least maybe we should be, but I think you'll be interested to learn about some research going on at Tufts University. In the lab, they used a simulated brain and learned that a virus that many of us carry all of our lives might be associated in triggering the start of a process that results in damage to our neurons. They also found that the compounds in red wine and green tea may play a role in preventing that damage. Interesting research, so I wanted you to know about it. I got in touch with Diana Karens. She is a research assistant at the Kaplan Lab to learn more about her work, what it means for all of us. Well, yeah, let's just jump right to the bottom line of what's going to affect most consumers. Does your research indicate that this red wine and green tea components might be something that would help me fight Alzheimer's? That's a great question. Um, so one thing to sort of, you know, preface everything with is that these were laboratory-based studies. They weren't done in people. And, and so you kind of have to take some of the findings a bit abstractly. But in general, yes, they do seem to suggest that, um, you know, supplementing your diet might might actually benefit you in the long run in preventing Alzheimer's disease. Oh, that's fascinating. So let's back into how you, you learned this. So my understanding is you sort of simulated a human brain in a Petri dish and then exposed it to a virus. Now, what's a virus have to do with Alzheimer's? So actually, um, herpes simplex virus one, which is the or HSV one, the virus that causes cold sores, that's what it's predominantly known for, um, has been speculated to have a causative role in, in sporadic Alzheimer's. It was first postulated in the early 90s, and a lot of research has come out since to suggest that um, having an infection like this may actually trigger uh, some of the characteristics of Alzheimer's disease, which include beta amyloid plaque formation, uh, phosphorylated tau, and, and some of the other neurodegeneration uh, effects, such as cognitive um, failure. And so this uh, in vitro model basically utilize that whole concept to take these, these small brains in a dish and infect them with that virus to show that they also uh, would develop these deleterious plaques that are found in Alzheimer's patients. Yeah, so when we're talking about plaques, we're really talking here about a combination, a collection of proteins, right, that form on the neurons and sort of gum up operation of the brain. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay, so the, the herpes simplex virus, the cold sore virus, seems to cause the formation of these plaques. And then what did you do to, to try to attack these plaques and dissolve them? So actually, we've looked at more, uh, more from a preventative standpoint. So we were essentially treating okay. these, these brains with these compounds at the same time of infection to show that if if you uh, treat these brains with, for example, resveratrol, some of these other compounds uh, in the presence of virus, they actually don't develop Alzheimer's uh, characteristics, which is pretty uh, striking to think about because um, uh, I think is, is beneficial from the standpoint that you could be supplementing your diet with some of these things as a, as a younger person or throughout the course of your life to potentially stave off future neurodegeneration. So I have this virus. So many of us carry this virus all the time. Do we know what, what lights it up? Is there something that, that causes it to kind of jump into this mode where it's damaging to the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. So like you said, most people just carry it all the time in, in latent form. So that means while you, you have the virus present in your body, it's not active. There's no active infection. Um, even, even people can carry it asymptomatically and have no cold sores, for example. So what can happen, uh, particularly in, uh, you know, the elderly or the immunocompromised is you can have some sort of triggering event that causes reactivation of that virus and allows it to even penetrate the brain, <clears throat> in which case, you know, that, that virus can, can trigger this beta amyloid cascade and, and cause these plaques to form. So, for example, some triggers we've studied in our lab, uh, we recently published a paper that uh, demonstrated that the, another virus, the virus that causes shingles, can cause this kind of 
triggering event. You know, a lot of older people will will come down with shingles and then, you know, kind of shortly thereafter will find themselves, unfortunately, with some cognitive decline. So there's there's sort of a connection there. And then also um, head trauma is another one we've looked at in, in our system. And we have found that um, even mechanical injury can cause um, can cause a, a triggering of this uh, HSB1 reactivation and downstream effects. So uh, shingles is caused by the varicella zoster virus. That's the that's chickenpox. So if you've had chickenpox, that virus is in your system. So does that tell me that uh, is having the shingles vaccine, for example, the new Shingrix vaccine that's out today, is that going to help improve my chances of avoiding Alzheimer's? It, it, actually, yes. So there have been population studies that have shown um, by a colleague of ours, in fact, that if you, people who have received the, the varicella vaccine actually have reduced incidence of Alzheimer's disease uh, later in life. So it's, wow. yeah. Good, good. Another reason to have that vaccine. So do we know what's causing uh, this? How does the virus cause the plaque to start forming and gumming up my neurons? Yeah. So, so the school of thought is sort of that the HSV-1 uh, infection kind of induces this amyloid response. So initially, the formation of these proteins uh, is in some ways beneficial because it it's induced and it is meant to kind of trap virus and get rid of it. So that's kind of uh, how that works. But unfortunately, what happens is is that it can't always be cleared. Once these proteins build up in, in trap virus, you, you can no longer clear it. And the accumulation of these proteins is what causes what causes um, the neurons to die. It causes uh, impaired functionality of, of the brain network and signaling, and, and that's kind of what happens. So the brain is trying to protect itself from the virus by creating these proteins that are sticky and gum up the neurons and trap the virus. Do I have all that right? Basically, so when, it's, when it first starts out, they're in kind of a soluble form, which means it's a, proteins are, are very fluid. And so unfortunately what can happen is, is once too many of those proteins have been generated and, and coagulate together, that's when, when the problem starts. And there are people who are uh, kind of genetically predisposed to having that um, happen more often or, or they can't clear those plaques as well as, as other people. Fascinating. All right, so now let's move to, we've, we've identified what might be causing these plaques. So the idea here is to try and prevent them. And you tested a lot of different compounds. Uh, give me an example of what you tested and what worked the best. Sure. We, we tested some that are, um, so we first sort of scanned the literature for different molecules and compounds that may be implicated in this disease based on their role in other diseases. For example, um, Green tea catechins is one that's known to be anti-inflammatory, has kind of a role in cancer. So we were thinking um, with neurodegeneration, there's there's a big role of inflammation as well. Maybe some of these compounds can be used in this capacity as well. So some other ones we tested were um, curcumin, which is found in uh, turmeric, you know, common spice. Um, metformin, which is a, a drug uh, prescribed for diabetes and actually has been uh, I think recently postulated as a, as a weight loss drug. Um, so that's, mm -hmm. that's another one. Um, and resveratrol, which as you mentioned is, is found in, in wine and, and a lot of other foods. And that's one that's, um, gained some attention as an anti-aging, uh, compound, which has shown some promise in that capacity as well. Yeah, it's fascinating. We've covered, uh, we've covered some of that on the program before, so uh, the green tea extract, I think, is uh, available in supplement form under the name of EGCT, right? Or EGCT? EGCG? Um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, you can e put it. EGCGC, mm -hmm. that's right, yeah. Yep, exactly. And then resveratrol, of course, you can take that in capsule form. Do you have any idea how this stuff is getting past the blood-brain barrier? I mean, our bodies are designed so that stuff that's in the blood can't really reach the brain. It's a protective mechanism. So how would those compounds get to the point of action? Right. That's a, that's a good question. And some, unfortunately, don't. I mean, there have been studies that have, have looked specifically at the pharmacokinetics of some of these 
uh, molecules as it pertains to other systems. Um, but some, for example, uh, like curcumin has been shown uh, to be detectable in the cerebrospinal fluid of the brain. So that's one that they know, um, you know, can penetrate and, and has been shown to even bind to um, some of these amyloid plaques in, in animal studies. Um, so so there, there's certainly more plenty of room to um, explore this. Uh, this idea of of enhancing some of these mo molecules to better penetrate the blood brain barrier to increase bioavailability because there's no like you mentioned there's no guarantee that just ingesting these uh, these supplements will actually make it to your brain and and have the effect we hope it does. Um, but there's something going on. I mean, I've seen I've seen research that indicates people on metformin have a lower rate of Alzheimer's than others. So somehow there's something happening there, right? Right, yeah, and, and um, Alzheimer's has actually been called uh, diabetes type three due to its, um, you know, its correlation to insulin resistance and, and things like this. So, so it's, it's possible that there's a, a connection there with, with how metformin works in, in um, treating diabetes as well. So where does your research go from here? What do we use, how do we use this information in the lab? Yeah, so I think there are a few avenues uh, of research that we can pursue from this point. Like you had mentioned, one, uh, one focus might be to understand the kinetics of some of these molecules in animal models. So you can't um, necessarily understand uh, how these molecules may get into the brain in the absence of doing some animal studies. Uh, there can be... Um, you know, other options to modify the, the drug delivery of some of these, these compounds. And, and one thing we're also interested in is, is really understanding, um, you know, outside of the, the supplement side of this story, we want to understand some of the, um, the additional triggers that can reactivate uh, HSV-1 to cause Alzheimer's. So I think identifying some of those triggers can really help to inform um, you know, future downstream treatment strategies to prevent um, prevent Alzheimer's from occurring. So, do, is there a connection if I have if I have frequent uh, fever blister outbreaks? Does that make me more inclined? Do you know anything about how any relationship there? Or is it too soon to say? No. So that's um, there actually is a, a connection there. So. Um, so the, the gene that predisposes people or the gene variant that predisposes people to, uh, to Alzheimer's disease also predisposes them to some of the manifestation of, of HSV1, such as cold source. So this gene called apolipoprotein E variant four, mm -hmm. um, people with that, um, that possess that uh, gene variant often exhibit, you know, increased cold sores and some of the other um, common manifestations of HSV-1 and unfortunately are also at much higher risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. So that connection does definitely exist. And there has been um, studies to demonstrate that um, receiving a course of antiviral treatment at some point in your lifetime, for example, if people who are, um, you know, prone to cold sores often will be prescribed Valtrex is the most commonly uh, commonly known drug for that indication. Um, people who have had repeated courses of Valtrex have been shown to have reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease as well. Fascinating. So interesting. So tell me about uh, what your research has meant in your life. Now, are you, have you changed what you're doing? Are you now taking any supplements because of what you found? Well, I've, I've been uh, prophylactically drinking red wine for, for years. So that's, <laughs> that's um, <laughs> yeah. really, doctor, it's, a, it's, it's for medical purposes. But <laughs> yeah. I understand you have to. You have to have, I mean, the concentration of resveratrol in red wine is, is minuscule compared to what's thought to be effective. So, I mean, a supplement is about the only way to get enough, isn't it? Right. So, I mean, the, there's pros and cons with that as well. I mean, anytime you, um, so supplements aren't regulated by the FDA or any other kind of True. regulatory agency. So when you, when you do take supplements, it's important to kind of do your research to make sure that they're pure, they're from a good source. Um, so there's that, but, but I certainly take, um, take some of the, you know, I've, I've drink quite a lot of green tea. 
uh, resveratrol. I, I do try to take um, and it, their natural forms. It's not just in red wine. It's also in a lot of fruits and, and nuts, which is um, mm -hmm. which is good. And curcumin, you can you can incorporate into your into your cooking. I, uh, I, well, I, I'm right there with you. I've been taking, uh, curcumin, um, and resveratrol and all those other things because of the alleged anti-aging influence, which they think is also associated with inflammation, which kind of comes right back around to what we're talking about in the brain, right? We're trying to avoid that inflammation in the brain. So I, there's, I don't know, research is all over the place, but Hey, you know, these things probably are going to hurt you. So my attitude is why not? Um, I think it'll be interesting to see where your research goes. Thank you so much. Very interesting talking with you. Thank you. It was great chatting with you.